Hey guys, so um, tonight we're gonna talk about anticoagulation versus antiplatelet. And um, I'm doing this video because I get this question a lot. A lot of people get kind of confused about what is an anticoagulation is what an, what is an antiplatelet and when would I need to like expect, when would I expect to see this um, in one or the other? Remember, you're not prescribing these, but it's important that when you see this on your patient's MAR or medication list that you understand, hey, it can kind of actually tell you a lot about maybe what the patient has in their history or what they have going on. So let's talk about um, antiplatelets first. And to understand antiplatelets, you have to understand what platelets normally do. So normally, um, when like you know, platelets are going around helping to, um, you know, clot off things when you have bleeding and stuff like that. Um, and one of the things that platelets love to do is that um, they love to clump together and hang out in groups. Um, and so when they clump together and hang out in groups and they're floating around, then they, they float behind, they see, oh, there's damage in that vessel wall. Let's go cover that up. They love to do that. So it's one of their favorite jobs. So an antiplatelet stops the platelets from sticking together so much. So they're not gonna stick to those walls. Now you may want, you may think like that's a good thing there's damage to my wall I want them to clump together but here's the thing is these platelets know no self-control and so they're very extreme things so they end up they can form really big blockages along your artery walls because they're clumping together and then sticking trying to help but really they're just making things worse um, so um, that's the effective action of antiplatelets. When you see um, an antiplatelet on your patient's MAR, you would either see clopidogrel most likely, or um, you might also see aspirin. And you're always gonna look for aspirin 81 milligrams. A lot of students get confused by this. Aspirin 81 milligrams is not for pain. It's actually used to, um, uh, what do you call it, effectively what we call like a cardiac prophylaxis or prevent cardiac events. Because effectively, um, if you see a patient on an antiplatelet, in your brain, you should start thinking, okay, this patient must have some cardiovascular disease. They probably have a history of hypertension, CAD, CSA, maybe PAD, um, peripheral artery disease. There's something going on where there's plaques forming or damage happening to their walls of their arteries. Because, you know, we give antiplatelets because we're pretty much expecting their to be damaged there on those walls. And so we know platelets are gonna go for that damage and try to help and make things worse. So we give this prophylactically. In other words, patients take this daily. Um, it is not an anticoagulant, it is not a blood thinner. It just stops them from, um, their platelets from clumping together uh, and then adhering to the vessel wall and creating a, a pretty much like setting up a scene for a blood clot to attach and create a huge blockage. So we're really just trying to prevent risk for like heart attack and stroke and other cardiac events like that. Um, with this, your biggest concern is bleeding. One of the cool things about antiplatelets is they really don't require any therapeutic monitoring. Um, we may check a platelet count, but this is not something that it's like cutting your platelets in half or decreasing your platelets. It's just stopping them from sticking together. Um, so we would, we would monitor that platelet level, but it's not like an, some anticoagulation, which we're going to talk about in a second, where you have to have regular therapeutic monitoring. Um, like you have to go in and make sure that it's in the right level. So there's also anticoagulants. Um, and so again, to kind of know how normally it works, normally there's this cascade and I call it the cool coagulation cascade because I'm cool like that. Um, but effectively there's this like whole like kind of circle or chain of events that has to happen for a clot to form. And anticoagulants go in there and they block part of that so it takes longer or you're less likely to form a clot. Now we don't want to completely block your ability to form a clot at all because if we did that, you'd be bleeding to death. But we want to decrease your risk or decrease the time it takes you to form a clot. Um, these do not bust clots. They do not break up clots that are already formed and they only stop you from forming new clots. Um, so, you know, the, when you're, you know, I told you before that for the patient, like for antiplatelets, you should think, hey, this patient has something wrong with their blood vessel lining, like hypertension, PAD, CAD, something like that. There's something wrong cardiovascular wise. With a patient, if you see an anticoagulant on a patient, they don't necessarily have cardiovascular disease, but here's some of the top things they may be already have a blood clot and we're trying to prevent more from forming so they may have a dvt or a pe they could be an atrial fibrillation 
Um, or they could just be a high risk patient in the hospital. Maybe they're um, bedridden in the hospital. Maybe they recently had surgery, especially bone surgeries, put you more at risk for getting a blood clot. So um, you really like when you see an anticoagulant, instead of sitting there and um, uh, what do you call it? Um, you know, like uh, trying to like, you know, figure out like, oh, why is this person on it? Think these are going to be the common things. So you kind of like kind of do your little check marks in your head and be like, hey, are they uh, immobile? Are they in the hospital? Have they had surgery? Um, do they maybe already have a blood clot? Um, do they have a history of atrial fibrillation or one of those abnormal rhythms? So those are the questions you should be answering yourself. And this one as well also has a biggest concern for bleeding. Um, like I brought up, this one is different. Um, you know, like I said, with platelet, um, antiplatelets, we're really just trying to stop those cardiac events. Um, whereas with anticoagulants, we're really trying to stop you from um, forming new clots. And so we like to keep anticoagulants in a very um, narrow therapeutic um, range. In other words, I want them to be to take a little bit longer to form a clot because if they're if they're only taking a little bit of time, they're going to be high risk and more likely to form clot. But I also, like I said, I don't want to block all clotting. Then I'm on this end of the spectrum and the patient's bleeding to death. So um, I want to stay in that nice little middle ground um, and keep in that therapeutic range. And I have a couple videos over the therapeutic monitoring and stuff like that um, with anticoagulation if you want to watch that. Um, but anticoagulants antiplatelets obviously differ in multiple ways. While they have a lot of the same risk factors, anticoagulants are stronger. They're going to prevent more clots from forming or take longer to form clots, which significantly decreases your risk. So again, these are for people that either are at risk for a clot or already maybe have a clot. Again, it's not going to bust their clot, but it's going to stop them from forming another. Um, whereas when you sit there and you think antiplatelet, you should be thinking, okay, this is a patient that has cardiovascular disease. They're at risk for problems. They don't have problems yet. And and I'm giving this to kind of decrease those platelets from sticking together um, and creating a battleground for more clots to attach and cause problems. So hopefully that helps. When you're thinking about these, just think about, okay, what um, do I need to check before I'm giving these medications, start thinking about, okay, is there any monitoring that I need to check? Is there any labs that I need to check? Um, you know, for both of them, they're going to need good teaching about bleeding precautions and things like that. But you want to really look big picture and see like, okay, how does this connect to their disease process? How is this going to help this patient? Am I preventing something? What am I preventing? And so start trying to think about, you know, um, these in actual practice and in some of the um, patients that you're going to, the other disease processes we've already learned about. And hopefully this kind of breaks down some of those differences um, so that you better understand it. I'll see you next time.